How many of you grew up having family dinners on Sundays? Yeah, there's nothing like it. We had my parents, my mom's mother and father, my great aunt and her husband, my great grandmother, and then thrown into the mix were us five kids, and sometimes there were others, church friends or other relatives, and I have 63 cousins, so you never knew who was going to show up at the table. Um, now, I have to tell you about two of them. Nain was my great aunt, and she, Lawi, um, were sisters. That was my grandmother. And just by way of background, they grew up in the Depression era, and they grew up in a blended family in an era that was unheard of. Yeah, divorce was, was not accepted at all, and so they grew up with that stigma over their family. Their stepbrothers were functional alcoholics on top of it, and one was a jazz musician. I'll leave that until later. <laughs> now that background affected them in lots of different ways. My grandmother, Lolly, for example, loved music, and she actually loved jazz, as I do, but we didn't know that until close to her death. My sister was making a video about her and asking her questions about her life so that we'd have a record of the family, and they asked her to play something on the video, and she got this really impish grin on her face, and she sat down and she played the Wabash Cannonball. <laughs> Memory, perfectly. Yeah, we were all floored because we never heard her play anything but church music. You know, she played the organ from the time she was 14 till she was 84. We didn't know she played anything else. <laughs> but it left us with that question, why didn't she play that before? Because obviously she knew how. Um, well, we didn't know all those things that I shared with you then. And it would be years before we would start to recognize that some of the unexpected responses that my parents and grandparents and my family had were actually responses to the fear that my family had experienced. My mother, for example, had this hatred for any music that wasn't acceptable in nature, and she defined acceptable. Acceptable meant church music, and some of you will understand this, Lawrence Welk. <laughs> and the odd one out was Perry Como. Not sure how he fit in there, but... Um, and as I was growing up and, and learning to play instruments, you know, we weren't encouraged to play or sing anything other than classical music or hymns. So when I started playing for the church choir and we sang modern music, you would think that my mother would be happy that I was involved in church and playing for a church choir. Not so much. And we fought about it all the time. Why? Makes no sense, except in later life I recognized that all those taboos were attached to that family fear, and if we played music other than this certain top, that we too would grow up as alcoholics. Now, isn't that strange? But you know those things affect families, don't they? Yeah. And my great aunt Nain responded a little differently. The family never had much money on top of growing up in the midst of the Depression. My great grandfather had been disabled working on the railroad, and, and of course, the alcoholism of the two boys radically affected their finance. Her response to all that was to grow up determined never to find herself in that situation. And so she became a truant officer with the schools. Do you know what a truant officer is? If you're my age, you probably do. But basically, she was the one who chased down the kids who skipped and the parents who let them. And every summer then, she and her husband, who was a brick mason, would, instead of taking that summer off, they would build a house, literally build a house. And then they'd rent it out to bring an extra income. And so fear drove them to work of the time. There was never a break in that family. Now that's just one issue that's resident in my family, but think about the expectations that it set, the concept of what was appropriate, what was not, and think about the division that it caused by unspoken fears and even the joy that was robbed by it. So whether we grow up in a healthy family or a not so healthy one, we all bear the marks and the responses of our families, of our upbringing, and some of those marks are visible. Some of them are mental, some of them set rightful expectations, some plant unspoken fears, don't they? Yeah. Mm. Well, when Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he makes it clear that he's writing to a family of God. And they not only come in various stages of spiritual maturity, as we talked about last week, but they also come from different backgrounds. 
Some are Jewish with traditions that permeate every aspect of life. There's a right and a wrong way to do everything. Some come out of a culture where the understanding of religion is one of superstition. Gods are to be appeased, not known. Most of the church wasn't Jewish in background, and so they grew up in a culture that was highly sexualized and one that was driven largely by money and power. No matter how they grew up and what they learned from culture, now they were all expected to be a part of the family that lived as a reflection of God and that looked like Jesus Christ. You see what a monumental task that is? All right, so in part of this letter, Paul's trying to define what that would look like. And so he writes it in this way, remember that in Christ you are new creations. All that stuff that happened in the past, you are brand new in Jesus Christ. And that's the mindset he's calling us to have as we look at these characteristics. Now I'll tell you that some are going to make perfect sense because you've lived them all your lives. Some are going to be reminders, maybe some ouches. Others are going to make you go, huh? So I want to make a deal with you, all right? My task this morning is not to condemn because that's the voice of the enemy and I don't ever want to be in cahoots with him. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, comes to bring conviction for one purpose so that we can repent, be forgiven, and move on to become those new creations. So that's our task today. So at the conclusion of uh, this sermon, I'm going to ask you how these teachings find you and we're going to use a very brief time of meditation to allow God to work with what we've heard. Does that sound like a plan? Yes. All right. Paul deals with seven primary areas in this scripture passage. Interesting that number seven just keeps popping up, isn't it? And this passage runs from Ephesians 4, 17 to 5, 20. So if you want to know what I'm talking about is really in the Bible, you go back and read it this week, all right? You heard a little bit of it earlier. Paul first deals with our words and he gives these understandings all in terms of relationship. He says, quit lying, instead speak the truth. He says, watch what you say, that is, don't speak rotten, corrupt words, useless words, but instead speak what will build others up. Maybe we shouldn't snort at each other. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> watch even the way you speak, if you're angry, don't shout in anger. Don't quarrel with raised voices and be careful not to speak ill of anyone. Ouch. So some of you are probably squirming just a little bit. Perhaps um, if you grew, your family grew up shouting at each other. Um, my family didn't shout. When my mom was mad, she'd stamp her foot and she'd say, Quad! And he'd just laugh and he'd say, Well, mother. <laughs> and then they'd go talk. And that's as mad as it got in my household. My husband's family, on the other hand, screamed at each other. The very first time that I went to meet him, I walked into the dining room and my sister-in-law was screaming at her kids. And I just backed right back out of that door because I was really uncomfortable. And she didn't understand why I was uncomfortable when we talked about it later. Because that's the way they dealt with, it, dealt with each other all the time. They, they screamed at each other. That was the norm. That's what they were accustomed to. But I'm going to say something to us as a body of Christ. If the way we normally deal with something makes somebody else comfortable, uncomfortable, pardon me, we need to find a new norm, don't we? So that we don't become a stumbling block to them. Later in that same passage, Paul addresses other types of words that are out of place in Christian living. The first two are obscenity and coarse talk, and they have kind of the same connotation, vulgar expressions, things that you wouldn't say in front of Jesus, although now we put them on t-shirts and we think it's funny. Amen or ouch. But it includes indecent talk like sexual innuendo, but it also includes anything that would be disgraceful, embarrassing, or shameful to anyone else. We're not to speak those things now. The last thing that Paul writes about is foolish talk. Now, Proverbs says the fool says in his heart there's no God. And that word in this passage has um, the same roots. Foolish talk is anything that lacks in godly wisdom, such as the offering of advice that doesn't honor God. It includes, includes those things that despise the things of God. That's foolish talk. Now, here's the scary thing about our words. All right, Matthew 12, 36 says that we will have to give an account of every careless word that we've spoken. 
and that it's by our words we'll be acquitted or condemned. <laughs> so would your words acquit or would they condemn? That's just one of these. I promise you some of them are shorter. All right, a second issue that Paul addresses is that of anger. There are three words used for anger in the New Testament. All three of them are present in this passage, and they all address a different type of anger. The first is tumos, and it's translated rage, and it means a turbulent commotion, a boiling agitation of feelings and passions that boil up a little like a volcano, and then it erupts, and it runs over others. And Paul says that's never appropriate. It's always sinful. And if you've ever been on the receiving end of that, you know why. It's terrifying, isn't it? The second is paragorismus. I know you're going to remember all these Greek words. Remember, I'm the Bible nerd. They thrill me. Um, but it's frequently translated as wrath. And that's anger that's mixed with irritation, exasperation, and embitterment. It's an anger or frustration that builds up over the constancy of the stuff. Kevin, a little bit like if you weren't such a kind person, you might get frustrated by the constancy of these things that don't work and those things that don't work. Instead, you just keep on smiling. Thank you, Lord. And Paul writes, don't let the sun go down on that stuff, but rather get rid of it, whether you talk it over with someone, as sometimes we need to do, don't we? Or whether you simply offer it to God so that when you wake up that next morning, there's new mercies every morning, right? All right, the third is orge. That's the one that appears in verse 26. The command in your anger, do not sin, is what that one means. Now this is interesting. One of my commentaries suggests that this type of anger is anger that's constantly within us but kept under control. Now why would that be? It's anger that bubbles up when we view unjust circumstances. That makes sense because that's a characteristic of God. The scriptures describe him as becoming angry at the mistreatment of people, rather, whether it's oppression or injustice. And that commentator suggests as those created in his image that those things should make us angry too. But he's quick to say, even in that anger, do not sin. And Martin Luther King Jr. encouraged us as a nation to tap into that kind of anger to help us get rid of something that was unjust and oppressive, not by fighting, but by being part of the change. Does that make sense to you? All right, that's anger that's rightfully used. A good counsel will, counselor will tell you that anger is given to us to help us deal with circumstances, but as Paul writes, there's a way to deal with them rightly or we give the devil a foothold in our responses, and we don't want to have anything to do with his ways, do we? The third issue that Paul addresses is that of stealing. We know not to take things that, belong, that don't belong to us, don't we? Um, but there's an ethical side to this that's implied in the scripture. It says, don't steal from an employer, rather to give a good day's work. In fact, work as if you were working for God, right? We should be the best employees a business has. Malachi says, don't steal from God by not giving a full tithe. Amen. Ouch. Ew. And we're not to cheat, uh, not to cheat even the government, rather to give Caesar what's due Caesar. Now, I'll leave that. <laughs> And we'll move on to number four. Um, <laughs> the fourth is a sound work ethic. Paul writes, work so that you have something to share with others. Um, in the United Methodist Church, of which Betty just joined together, we normally speak of using our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Those are all ways that we work together in the church, aren't they? And Paul takes it a step further. He writes, be careful how you live. In other words, be a good steward over your life. Don't be unwise, but be wise and vigilant. In fact, make the most of every opportunity. So don't be foolish, but rather understand what the Lord's will is. He says we're here for God's purposes. Every day, every moment is an opportunity to be Christ to someone who needs to see him. That might be a family member. It might be a coworker, might be a neighbor or someone you meet on the street. But if you're going to have that work ethic in Christ, recognize that you have something to share. So be careful. Be watchful. Make the most of every opportunity that you have to share Jesus Christ. 
They meddle, don't they? They kind of call us to say, eh, ow. These last three are going to be worse, I'm sorry. <laughs> there comes a time when you just have to say what needs to be said. Paul knows the church. He knows the culture in which it exists. And so he gives even more explicit direction for everyday life in these last three. He says there shouldn't be a hint of sexual immorality among you. <gasps> she said sex in church. She did. So did Paul. And the Greek there is descriptive. It's porneia, from which we get our word pornography. But it refers to any illicit form of sex. And so let's listen to what it means to live faithfully sexually. Faithfulness in marriage. Celibacy and singleness. Job would add, watch what your eyes see. And Jesus would add, stand guard over your thoughts. Because all of those can lead us in a wrong direction, won't they? Mm -hmm. All right, breathe. Paul also writes that there should be no greed among us because both sex and greed deal with uncontrolled appetites. And both can destroy us by planting unholy desires in us. Think for just a minute, who is to be the primary object of our desire? God is, and so when we place some other desire ahead of him, or we do other things rather than honoring him, we make those an idol, don't we? And it takes the place of God in our lives. And lastly, Paul writes, don't get drunk on wine because that leads to debauchery. My mother would approve. But he gives us a great alternative. He says, get filled with the Spirit. Have you ever been around a bunch of people who just love Jesus? I hope that's here. <laughs> that should be the most fun group that you're ever a part of. Think about it. Those fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control, all of those things should be evident in us. We should be the most joy-filled people around, shouldn't we? That, that group ought to be a blast, a safe bunch to be around. And if not, we just need more of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> now I imagine that as Paul's letter was read in all those churches, there was some assent to those things he addressed. There were probably some oh my's. Because remember, they grew up in a different culture. And in some, maybe like here, there were some toes that were stepped on. Perhaps that's why Paul drives his teaching home with these words. You can be sure of this. Anyone who lives in immoral, greedy, or impure ways has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Mm -hmm. Wow. Ow. Now there's two common arguments that we might use against Paul's words. One, the argument from culture. Everybody does it. What would your mother say about that? If everybody were jumping off a bridge, would you go jump off of a bridge? That has no validity. You know that. <laughs> but the second is a misquoting of who Jesus is and what he came to do. But Jesus talks about mercy. Yes, he does. But he doesn't hesitate to say, sin is sin, does he? Yeah. To both of those things, Paul would respond with these words, let no one deceive you with empty words, because it's because of these things that the wrath of God will come. You know what they are now. And so don't do them. Live differently. In our lives, reflect Christ. Because Jesus, as Jesus revealed God to the world, so we, his family, are to reveal Jesus Christ to the world. You need some good news? Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> this family that we're invited into was created to be that safe place, um, a place where we know how to act, but also a place where it's understood that yeah, we're human. We are going to make mistakes in the way that we deal with things and the way we treat each other and in the way we respond to each other. And so Paul writes, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as Christ forgave you and as dearly loved children walk in the way of love. So how are we doing? <laughs> Brian, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and come on up and get ready. Um, I don't want to just leave those things having spoken them over you. 
As the, uh, at the conclusion of each day, John Wesley, who was our founder, did what was termed an examination of conscience. And he would look back over the day and consider the interactions that he'd had, the situations that he faced, and in each, the question, how do we represent Christ? And so I'm going to walk back through um, just a couple of these, ask you some questions, and leave those to your time with the Lord. And Brian's going to sing a song of blessing over us. So as our examination, let's ask these questions. What do your words reveal to, to those around you about Jesus Christ? Whose anger does your anger most mimic? God's or someone else's? If someone accused you of stealing from your employer, from God, from the government, how would you plead? What does your work ethic teach others about the just God that we serve? Sexuality is a gift. How are you honoring God with that gift? Is there anything that you desire more than God? And are you most frequently drunk on wine or filled with the Spirit of God? You know, we've received lots of things from our families, from the culture around us. Which of those needs to be laid aside so that we can become the new creation that Christ intended us to be, one that's capable of reflecting his glory? And the last question, who might we need to forgive or of whom do we need to ask? forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, you alone know what these words have touched. And we've laughed about them, we've joked about them, we've said ouch about them. But some of them need to be addressed. And so we pray right now that you would have full reign in our hearts and lives. That you would give us eyes to see you, hearts that are purposed on you. And we ask that you might come and that you would examine our hearts and use a scalpel as only you can. Remove what doesn't belong there. Be the healer. Bring that balm. Be the encourager. Lord, whatever that work is, cause us to leave this place in peace with you, in love with one another, knowing that we are a dearly loved part of the family of God. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ and let the church say, Amen. Amen.